Hi, I'm Melina Wang, and welcome to Discovering China. Coming up on today's show, we talk to one New York-based Chinese art expert about ivory carving. Check out the story of Xiang Yu, one of ancient China's most ferocious warriors, and smell the scent of spring flowers in Taiwan. Ivory is a material that has been used for thousands of years in China to create works of art as well as practical objects. We now talk to Chinese art expert Lark Mason about the beauty of traditional ivory carvings and the controversy surrounding the contemporary ivory trade. It's very useful for carving and produces beautiful uh, works of art. It's one of China's oldest artistic materials. The history of the elephant really is what one's talking about because that's where ivory comes from. It's, a, it's from the tusk of the elephant. It goes, extends back literally thousands of years in China to the very earliest periods of time, to the Shang Dynasty or, or even before the Shang Dynasty. There's good reason for the extensive use of ivory throughout Chinese history. Eye Gavel Auctions president Lark Mason says ivory is very versatile. So ivory was a this, was this substance that was almost indestructible and yet became more beautiful the more often it was handled. So it had a range of purposes from artworks to fulfilling purely utilitarian uh, functions, uh, serving as, as uh, moldings on furniture or works of art or mounts on objects that needed to be very durable and to withstand pressure. Among other works of art, Mason's auction house sells antique ivory objects. This was made in the 18th century. It's a, carved as a work of art, not, an, not as an object necessarily of veneration or anything, but just a beautiful carving. And it's made of ivory, and it depicts a beautiful lady. And she likely was holding a fly whisk at one time, which is broken off in her hand. And she may have, in fact, been intended to be a representation of Guan Yin but she could have also just been an attractive young woman. And what's noticeable about this is the fineness of the quality of the carving, and for a lot of people, the unexpected use of color. This one happens to have a combination of black, red, and brown highlights. But the story of ivory doesn't end with beauty. You know, yes, it's wonderful to have an ivory object, but on the other hand, it comes at a tremendous cost. A cost many in China are unaware of. About 70% of the Chinese don't know that the elephants have to die for them to get ivory. It's illegal for African countries to sell ivory to China, but the trade continues on the black market. China continues to be the largest consumer of ivory. And there is data from CITES and there is data from independent studies that pinned the, uh, point directly to China as being a consumer of illegal ivory. This illegal trade has had a drastic effect on elephant populations. Um, you know, there's been a tremendous escalation of poaching since the Chinese uh, uh, came into Africa in numbers. Mason only auctions ivory objects made decades or hundreds of years ago. He does not condone the creation of new ivory carvings. I think that there are plenty of other materials that carvers could use that would simulate the appearance of ivory if people were willing to make that bridge. One alternative was developed in Japan. The Japanese can even make a substance that's just like ivory out of eggshells and other products. Today, the moral implications of modern ivory trade have made buying new ivory products socially unacceptable, but there are still a wide range of antique ivory objects on offer at auctions, works of art that carry the spirit of Chinese culture and capture the timeless beauty of this traditional carving material. Sheng Yu was one of China's most ferocious and vicious warriors. He's remembered for battling with Liu Bang as the Qing dynasty collapsed. The two generals were contending to become the next ruler of China. Here's the story. By the end of the Qin dynasty, China had fallen into chaos. Several forces were vying for control. In 209 BC, peasant rebellions erupted throughout the land, plunging China into a state of anarchy. 
Xiang Yu, born in 232 BC, was a descendant of an aristocratic general family. In his youth, Xiang Yu was instructed in scholarly arts, swordsmanship, and war strategies. But once he had understood the basics, he refused to learn more. Sheng Yu was giant in his physical appearance. No one could bend his arms, and he is said to have been able to lift 1,000 pounds. When Sheng Yu had grown up, King Huai of Chu appointed him as a second-in-command general. Sheng Yu, filled with exuberant zest for action, ended up killing the first-in-command while fighting a battle at Chu Lu. This left other generals horror-stricken, but no one dared oppose him. Xiang Yu did not win his battles with fine strategy, but instead with brutality. Meanwhile, the king placed Liu Bang in command of another army. The king declared that whoever would win the victory over Guanzhong in the heartland of the Qin would be granted the title King of Guanzhong. When Xiang Yu heard that while he fought the Battle of Ju Lu, Liu Bang was victorious and had become King of Guanzhong, Xiang Yu went berserk. He led his rebellion army into the defeated former Qin metropolis, killed the former ruler and his family. He claimed the title King of Guanzhong, depreciated and burned the palaces, and most important, the library of the Qin. But the king had approved Liu Bang as the King of Guanzhong. Now Xiang Yu saw Liu Bang as his main rival. It would be decided between the two who would rule China. Xiang Yu was the most powerful conqueror. He ordered to kill the emperor, divided the country into kingdoms, and basked in the power as the de facto leader of China. Wars between Xiang Yu and Liu Bang lasted five years. In the end, one man, Han Xin, who served Liu Bang as a leading general, thought of a strategy to defeat Xiang Yu. Han Xin's strategy worked. Liu Bang's armies attacked Xiang Yu from three sides. With Xiang Yu's army trapped, Liu got his troops to sing songs from the Chu region to make Xiang Yu and his men falsely think their homeland had been fully conquered. This broke their morale. Finally, Xiang Yu lost his men in the Battle of Gai Xia and cut his own throat at the banks of the Wu River. Liu Bang went on to found the Han Dynasty, considered China's first golden age. The expression, the songs of Chu coming from all sides, became a popular Chinese saying, meaning besieged on all sides. The Chinese remember Xiang Yu as a courageous yet brutal warrior. Now I'm sure you have all heard of Mid-Autumn Festival, but what about Mid-Spring Festival? Let's go and find out more in Taiwan. On February 15th every year, the Flower Festival, or Divine Flower Festival, takes place in Taiwan. This year in the city of Taichung, a special floral art exhibition is held in honor of the festival. The event includes various forms of art, emphasizing the four art forms that Chinese hold in the highest regard, flower arranging, incense, tea, and painting. The event is also accompanied by music and dance performances. We use our floral art with our insincere heart to wish to all the flowers happy birthday. The Flower Festival is the birthday of the Chinese flower goddess. This day is also when the first flowers start to bloom in spring. Flowers bloom according to the lunar calendar. This is what they call mid-spring festival, the middle day of spring. There's also mid-autumn festival. So one of these festivals has blooming flowers and one has the full moon. They are the most beautiful and happy times in the year. Heaven and earth both have a romantic feeling, the two most beautiful days. In the ancient Song dynasty, people considered upper middle class would all be trained in the four arts of flower arranging, incense, tea and painting. Eventually, dancing and music became just as important, so it became the six arts. Our flower arranging, sampling tea, hanging pictures, burning incense, and dance and music, we call the six arts of life in Taiwan. These six arts actually we assimilate them into our daily life. This year is Taichung's first floral arts exhibition. There are 130 floral art instructors participating in the creation of 67 floral art pieces. You come in through the representation of a bamboo forest and a curtain. We hope people can become calm and feel wisdom. 
Once you attain wisdom, in the process of burning some incense, your mind slowly calms down. You have the wisdom to experience nature. You are happy and content. At the event, people are invited to taste congee with rare flowers mixed in. People of Taichung welcome the spring together with a celebration not only of flowers but also the most important Chinese art forms. Well, thank you for watching Discovering China. We'll be back next week with more on traditional Chinese culture. But for now, goodbye.